John chapter 14, verses 19 through 24. Jesus said, a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Now, as we go through our study, let me remind you of a few things. Let me remind you that Jesus has been emphasizing this last night with his disciples that he was going to leave them in chapter 13, for example. Verse 33, he had said to them, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, Where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. So he said, I shall be with you a little longer. In chapter 14, we saw in verse 2 how he told them, I go to prepare a place for you, and then in Chapter 14, verse 12, he once again said, I go to my father. Now, his continued insistence that he was going has troubled his disciples. And that's why he says to them, let not your heart be troubled. This is also why he had said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Notice he said that in verse 18. I will not leave you orphans. Now, let me give you something I didn't give to you last time we were together in this verse. What does he mean when he says, I will not leave you orphans? Well, the original word in Greek means obscure because an orphan was deprived of a father and a mother because an orphan was little esteemed and was neglected and was obliged to wander about in obscurity and darkness. And that's why they would use that word orphan, obscure, because they wandered without anybody supporting them. Hebrew was different. The word translated orphan means to strip or make bare, because such a child is destitute of comfort, direction, and support, and would be prey to misery, disease, sin, and death. Now, at that time, the disciples of a particular teacher often called him father. You might know that or may not have known that. If I was being discipled by somebody, a rabbi, I would refer to him as my father. I would call him father. And uh, the scholars uh, would be called his children. And when that, when that rabbi died, his children, scholars, those whom he was mentoring, were referred to as orphans. So the word was spoken concerning those who had no rabbi, those who had no minister over them. What had happened, though, is during that day is the rabbis became so important to him that Jesus actually issued a warning to these people in Matthew 23, verse 9, when he said, Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. They had begun to elevate these rabbis to a place they should not have been. And that's why Jesus was speaking and said, Don't call them father. Why? Because the rabbis were mentoring their, their disciples. The disciples were calling them father. But when that rabbi died, they were considered orphans. And so Jesus, as the chief rabbi, is saying not to call any man on earth 
your father having that mentoring relationship because the one who was to have taken that place is Jesus himself, who is the master of them all. And so he's speaking concerning these things because spiritual truth comes from God. And that's why he's commanding us to, te- to uh, actually trust him. And so he's saying to them, uh, you shall not be left fatherless, meaning you shall not be left without a rabbi. You will not be left without a teacher. So he says to them, again, he says to them, I will not leave you orphans, but he also says, I will come to you. Now, last time we were together, I mentioned that his coming can have three basic aspects. One, he once again will see them after he's resurrected from the dead. There's that aspect of it. Secondly, he'll be with them at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descends on them. And then third, he will once again be with them at the rapture second coming that will take place in the yet future. And so as we look at this, we'll pick up now at verse 19, where he says, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. Jesus is about to be taken and crucified. After his death, the world will no longer see him physically. He's going to be physically removed from the world by his death. Well, the world rejects the spirit. And because the world rejects the spirit, they will not miss him. Notice verse 17, how he had said, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he refers to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Well, the spirit doesn't see him and know him. The the world doesn't perceive who the Holy Spirit is, and therefore the Holy Spirit is rejected by the world. And thus, because they're rejecting the Holy Spirit, they don't miss, they will not miss Jesus, and they're not going to be seeking after him. But he went on to say in verse 19, but you will see me. And then he goes on to say, because I live, you will live also. They think that I'm dead, buried, and gone, but you will see me when I'm resurrected. You will see me. I, 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 he will be alive. But you, notice this in verse 19, uh, you, because I live, I'm re- resurrected, you will live also. My resurrection will be the proof and promise of your own resurrection. Now, this is something that he has consistently been saying to them. All the way back in John chapter 3, verse 36, John the Baptist said, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. In John 5, 24, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And so because I live, you will live also. If you hear his word... And there are some right now listening that perhaps have heard the Bible, but you haven't really taken in his word. You haven't applied his word by faith in your own life. But when you hear his word, it's more than simply hearing it read. It's something deeper than that. It's, it's hearing with a heart to obey. If you hear his word in, in a Christian sense, means more than just hearing the sounds of the words being read. It, it, is, it is believing and holding fast to those words. That's how you're saved. And that's why Jesus would say, if you hear my word and believe, and that's how you're saved. You hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and you believe, and you believe in the one who sent him. Well, you have present tense everlasting life. And when you have a present tense everlasting life, you do not come into judgment or condemnation. You are passed from death into life. That comes through the hearing of the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Paul said to the Romans. And so when the message of the gospel is presented and the unbeliever hears and believes in the Father, they have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and you're born again. Paul made this kind of statement in in Romans in chapter 8, verse 11, 
where he said, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so Jesus is making it clear, because I live, you will live also. Later on, John, when he wrote 1 John, repeated this promise. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, he said, this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. This life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know. That's something you can have certainty with. You know, you give your heart to Christ, and God has made all these promises that he'd, he'd cleanse you from all of your sins, that, that you would become his child, that he would make your body his temple, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, that he's coming to receive you to himself. There's so many promises in Scripture, and, and the promises is, if you believe in me, you will never die. Remember how he asked Martha that? Do you believe this? He who believes in me will never die. And so we have a relationship with God. We move on into eternity because we have eternal life in him. And the Holy Spirit lives within us. And the Holy Spirit gives us the in, in, internal witness by his Holy Spirit. Uh, he bears witness with my spirit that, that I'm a child of God. I, I have that sense within me that I've been born again. Uh, somebody was writing to me recently. They listened to the uh, second, uh, second Corinthians study. And in the second Corinthians study, I was mentioning that, that uh, you could know um, your relationship with God. You can have a, a certainty in it. And uh, your sins are completely forgiven. And, and they wrote and they said, you know, that's the thing that they deal with all the time is their past. You know, the Holy Spirit uh, takes the, the word of God. We're going to see this in a moment. But he takes the word of God. And uh, as you, by faith, trust the word and believe that word, the Holy Spirit comes as it's imparted to you, and he actually, he actually works in your heart. So these things become a certainty. Uh, I, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that when I die, I go to heaven. I know that when I close my eyes here on earth and people say he passed on, uh, the bottom line is this, I simply changed residence and I went home. I'm going home. When my father... When my father um, went to be with the Lord, my wife Marie and I were working together with uh, some lawyer related to my father's death and all. And, and I said to him, what my father just went home. And this lawyer looks at me and he said, well, that's really an unusual way to say that. He said, wow, that, I like that. Apparently he had never heard that because I said my father went home. Well, you know, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You know, Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I mean, that's a promise from the Lord that, that we can take to the bank, if you will, and we can know that. And that's what Jesus is teaching us. He says, because I live, you will live also. Because I've been resurrected and I have resurrection life in me, you will have the same thing. Trust in that. It seems to me that there are quite a number of Christians today with this coronavirus thing going on right now that have forgotten that. And as I was sharing before, I've said it before, I'll say it quickly. The worst thing that'll happen to me if I were to get the coronavirus, and I'm speaking on a personal level, I'm not saying how people would feel if it happened. I'm just saying on a personal level, the worst thing that can happen to me personally is I go to heaven. I go to be with Jesus. I've been preparing myself in him for almost 50 years. So why would I be afraid to go to the place I've been wanting to go for all this time? So I don't want to live in fear. I, I don't live with presumption. I, I'm not running around kissing every person that I see. Um, I'm not being unwise. But I am definitely not afraid because I know in whom I have believed. And I know that he's able to keep that which I have given to him. And I know that he's begun a work in me that he'll continue and complete in the day of Jesus Christ. And I know that because he lives, 
I live also. That's the hope that we have. We just celebrated the reality of Christ who overcame sin and, and, and the devil and the grape. And, and, and we just celebrated Easter. We need to live as if Easter is every day in our life. And so he makes that very clear. He says, because I live, you will live also. In verse 20, at that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. You will know that. The Holy Spirit will make that clear to you. He goes on in verse 21 and he says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. He who has my commandments and keeps them. Notice how he says, keeps them. He who has my commandments and keeps them. Uh, I, I looked up the word has. I mean, when I, when I study the Bible, there are words that, that I think are, are, are important enough to look at. And when he said, he who has my, what does that word mean? So I looked it up. What, what was the, the Greek word for the word that is translated by the English word has? And so the Greek word is to lay hold of something, to cling to. But it goes on to say to personally own. He who has my word is the one who personally owns it. There's an ownership of the word of God. It's a person who is clinging to his commands. It's a person who observes them. The word is so important to them that their lives are actually built on the reality of the commands. When you have God's word, it's not that you're holding a Bible in your hand. When you have God's word, God's word actually has you, and you cling to it. It is what makes you alive. It's adhering to it. His word is, is to be more valued, like Job said, than my daily bread. You know, we, we know that, 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 that God's word proceeds from his mouth, and, and that is the bread that we need, the bread of life. I, I don't know how many people have heard that so many times that they forget that. Your, your life is built on something. What is it built on? What is the foundation? Everybody's life has a foundation. Everybody's life is built on something. We all know that. The question is, what is it built on? You know, is it built on, on sinking sand or is it built on the sure rock of Jesus Christ? And, and you, you may be a young Christian right now and you may be feeling overwhelmed by all your circumstances and all, but this is how you learn faith. You'll see this in a minute. This is how Jesus manifests himself to you. This is where you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that what you have said you believe, you actually do believe. It's when you go through things that test what you say you believe. Do you, do you hold fast to his promises? Do you, do you cling to them, adhere to them? Do you hold tightly to, to what you've read? And are you hungry to read his word? You see, we're to hold fast to God's word. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. 1 John chapter 2, verse 5, whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. 2 John, verse 6, this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. It's, it's what orchestrates my behavior. It's what informs me as to what is right and what is wrong. And love and faith are tied with uh, obedience. Uh, when you have a hunger for the word of God and, and to obey him, uh, that's what separates a genuine believer and that's uh, from one who professes to be a Christian. And that's been one of the identifying marks of a, of a genuine Christian. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 5, verse 29, we read, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments that it might be well with them and with the children forever. See, I, I want my life to be blessed, but my life isn't the only life that can be blessed by keeping God's word. My children 
will be blessed also. In my obedience to what Christ teaches, my children will see faith lived out in a home. There are a whole lot of people who are going through a lot of struggles right now. My heart is with you, of course. But, but has the Lord revealed anything to you about that? Some of you perhaps felt that Sunday was an option to go to church because your kid was in Little League or playing soccer or something like that, some sport. Or you worked six days and seventh day, you're supposed to have a rest, therefore you don't go to fellowship. You'll, you'll kind of do what you do and, and, and parent, and you're not aware that you've been training your child that worshiping God is an option, not something you really need to do. Are they watching you and learning from you? Are they discovering that this is a person that actually holds fast to God's word and does it so that you will be that voice above the waves? They'll be able to hear you when they're making decisions in their life that will affect them and you and everybody forever. That's why it's so important for us to stay in the word of God, to cling to the word of God, and it demonstrates that, that we know him. But it's not just so that my life is blessed. It's so that I can bless others, especially my children. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, we read, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. And so love and obedience are tied together. But Jesus also makes a promise. Notice in verse 21 how he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. I will love him and manifest myself to him. Love for the Son produces a deeper understanding of the love that God has for us. And this love for the Son results in a deeper manifestation and understanding of his love. In John 16, 27, we read, For the Father himself loves you because you've loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. Notice how Jesus said, I will love him and manifest myself to him. Do you want God to manifest himself to you? Uh, I know that, that, that that's the spiritual thing. Oh, yes, oh, Lord, show me your glory. Now, there's a song that we in this church sing. And the first time we sang the song, show me your glory, uh, I thought that's probably not the wisest thing to sing. I had to think it through a little bit and put it in a New Testament framework and the and the uh, intent of the author. Because in the Old Testament, we have a man who said to God, show me your glory. And God said, no man can see my glory and live. And I think that sometimes we, uh, we have uh, dumbed down the glory of God and elevated the goodness of man to the degree that we don't really understand what it would be like to see the glory of the Lord. You know, and so the bottom line is, is that, if I want to know the Lord, and Jesus made this promise, and let me make this point very quickly here. Do, do I want to have a manifestation of Jesus in my life? Let me ask you, even though you're my staff and I pay you to say yes. Um, that was a joke, by the way, for those watching online. Do you want God to manifest himself to you? I'm not quite sure everybody does. But say you do. Say you, say you want God to manifest himself, to reveal himself clearly. How can that happen? Some people say, well, go to the desert, take some granola, take some water, stay out there for 40 days. You'll see something. You will, probably hallucinations. You'll see something. But will it be a manifestation of the Lord? Oh, I'm going to do this. I'll pray and pray and pray, or I'm going to do this. It usually is related to some discipline of some sort that I'm supposed to do. Maybe I'll go to a monastery or 
or whatever. Let me tell you how Jesus said he would manifest himself to you. He said, obey me. Simple, isn't it? It's really simple. Obey me. I was sharing earlier how that when the 12 spies were sent into the land prior to Israel entering in and taking it, that as they spied out the land, they came back with a report. They said the fruit is in abundance. There's this big cluster of grapes that they brought back, and he said these, these things, it's amazing, the place that, that they have said, but we've been commanded to take. But then they began to speak amongst themselves and openly said this. They said, but there are giants in the land. There are giants. And it's interesting. Read the passage, and you'll see it's interesting how it, it's presented because they say, they say, we are grasshoppers in their sight. Speaking of the giants, because there were giants. They said, we are like grasshoppers in their sight. But read on, and it goes on to say, and we are like grasshoppers in our own sight which I found interesting. I found that interesting. I find that interesting. We are grasshoppers in their sight, so we began to see ourselves through their eyes. And so what we are is incapable of taking, even though God said, it's yours. And then you have these two others, Joshua and Caleb, and Caleb's 80 years old, and he says, give me the hardest place. He says, I may be 80, but I still am as strong as I was when I was 40. And I don't want to walk into something that I don't have to exert anything. At. I want to go in and prove myself a man. I, I think that if you were to survey the average Christians, that the 10 spies are represented by a good portion of what are called Christians. And the other two the men who are combat ready, who men of faith, men, men who want to excel, men who want to see God move, men who want to see God manifest themselves. There are very few of those today. There really are. And I don't say that to bemoan the fact of the church. And, it, and, and, and yet, in a sense, that's true. It's true. There are a lot who, who, who say, I believe, but when we're put, when our feet are put to the fire, we've got every excuse as to why we can't do that, why it's not possible. I don't understand that. If the Holy Spirit put it on your heart to do something, who can stand against him? Who can stand against him? If the Holy Spirit is in it, he's leading you, and you're obeying him, I don't know why you're afraid. It's a lack of faith. And I suspect that many churches are filled with the ten spies. Oh, it's got good things, great promises, love to have it. But it would require something on my part. I'd actually have to go to battle. And ah, we're like grasshoppers. Then you have some people, and the old people usually in the church are the ones that say, You're, we don't need old people, we need young people. Really? We need more Caleb's. We need, we need more men of valor who've experienced and have seen what God can do. It's like when David stood there before Goliath and everybody was trembling because this nine foot nine inch man, and who wouldn't tremble at the physical stature of somebody like that? But David looked at him and said, I'm a dog. Goliath says that you should come to me with sticks. And how David looked back at him, he says, you've got weapons of your warrior shield and all of that, and the javelin. You come, you come in battle array with physical weapons, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, and I'm going to take your head off your body, and the, and the birds of prey are going to eat your flesh. Oh, what a gross thing. And, and all the effeminate men say, ooh, that sounds gross to me. Do you know that? David was saying, my God, I come to you in the name of the Lord. You see, the church needs to wake up to that right now. We really do. We really do. We're living in a time right now where the church is folding because of a virus. God is greater than any virus. God is able. God is able. And I want to come in the name of the Lord, not in the name of presumption, 
but in the name of the Lord. I, I want to see God move. And I want to see him manifest himself. And he has. He has. All these new ministries, Monday night ministry, the young adults, Tuesday men's study, uh, Tuesday afternoon Facebook Live, Wednesday Bible study, Thursday uh, Facebook Live, Friday Q&A with my wife and me, and Saturday uh, Saturday, night, Saturday night study on marriage and the family. Sunday, three services in the morning, two in the morning, one in the afternoon, then an evening study. We're getting letters from people. They're saying, not everybody, but some are saying, I prayed with you. I gave my heart to Christ. I'm following God now. I'm being told by people that family members who wouldn't enter into a church are entering into time of study with us. Now they're listening. Sometimes eight, nine family members who don't go to church are listening to Bible studies, looking for an answer. That's taking place right now. And people are giving their offerings. This place, you know, is God is sustaining us. I, I remember when I was told that we could not gather together. We have 45, 50 staff members. We have a, a church grounds that we, we, we pay for. And, and my son Joseph and I were talking, uh, and I said to him, you don't understand what just took place. I said, this church is built on, on the word of God and community of, of the believer. We, 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 we we're built on fellowship, and, and now we don't have the opportunity to fellowship. I said, and I've never emphasized giving. Some people who are watching right now say, oh, it's all you pastors. You don't know me, and you don't know this church. I've never done that. I've always expected God to sustain, but I'm also a realist. And, and as that took place, and, and I, was I watched the news, they said all churches are being shut down. And my son Joseph was there, and I spoke to him, and I said, he said, God's going to move, Dad. And I said, son, you don't understand what's going on right now. You don't. I said, this may be the way that our fellowship ceases to exist. And as I spoke to him, I said, I didn't expect to leave ministry like this. And I cried. I cried in front of my son. I didn't expect my ministry to end like this. And I cried. My son was disturbed to see his father so distraught. Because, guys, I, 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 don't know, I don't only care about me. I care about us. I care, I care about you. I care about you. And, and it gripped my heart. And I prayed. I went to bed. Woke up the next morning praying. Father, what are we going to do? What are we going to do, Lord? I've never emphasized giving. I don't even know how to go about it. And he spoke to my heart a word that I've told you this recently, but he spoke to my heart a word. And he reminded me of something he had told me in my heart 38 years ago, I did not raise you up to let you fall. And I came to the office that day knowing that God has raised us up. If God has raised us up, God will hold us up. Do you believe that? I do. I do. I forgot for a moment. I had my moment in my own little garden. Oh, Lord, if you could remove this, please do. Paul's words ring true <laughs> in my weakness. Then I'm made strong. And God is taking care of us, guys. God is taking care of us in an abandoned campus. This is used, I'm used to life. People coming in. But God is taking care of us. Jesus said, if you keep my word, I will come to you. And I will manifest myself to you. He's doing that right now. He's manifesting himself. He's showing us that he can sustain us. You keep his word. You see, it's one thing to teach a Bible verse. It's another thing when that Bible verse teaches you. And the Lord does that. Love for Jesus is the motivation for what you do. And love for the Son has a, a fresh and deeper revelation 
of him. He said, I will manifest myself. So obedience results in a special sense of the presence of the Lord. And the knowledge that you have becomes experiential. It deepens your fellowship with Jesus. So if you want to see Jesus, love and obey him. Now, as he speaks in verse 22, Judas, and notice how he says, not Iscariot. Judas, not the betrayer. Judas said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Judas is a little-known apostle. He's also known by other names, Thaddeus and Labaius. And so he's saying, how is this going to take place? How is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? I thought you, you said that when you are revealed, it's going to be open. Jesus had said that in Matthew 24, 30, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So you said that when you're revealed, it's going to be open. But now you're saying you're going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world. How's that going to happen? And so Jesus in verse 23, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. We will make our abode with him, our home. It speaks of a permanent, eternal stay, not a temporary residency. We will come and abide with him. How will I manifest myself to you and not to the whole world? Well, the answer is simple. You're going to love me and obey me. I'm not speaking of my return. I'm speaking of fellowship. I'm going to be with you, and I will be in you. You see, where love for me and obedience to me is, there shall I be also. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you. I'm closer than, than your own heartbeat. I've never been alone since I gave my heart to Christ. Never. Marie knows this about me. I, I grew up a lonely kid. I grew up a lonely little boy. There's a song that I play sometimes, and I think of it, I tear up. It's an old song nobody would like, but it was by a guy named Neil Sedaka. There's a blast from the past. Some of you gray hairs know who he is. Neil Sedaka. It's called Solitaire. And I and I and the song always makes me tear up every time I hear it. Marie knows that she's seen me cry more than once because Solitaire is the game that I play to this day. Every night when I go to bed, I play solitaire every night. It's a game I've been playing since I was a little boy when my mom and dad taught me that game. My mama did. But when my mom was sick and my mom was working and my mom was at home and I spent years alone, solitaire means more than just a game. It speaks of being alone. And I was alone. I didn't have anybody in my life. Nobody. Nobody. I was lonely. I was a lonely boy. Very lonely. And then I came to faith in Christ. And I'm never alone. Now I'm never alone. Because he's with me. He will never leave me. Nor forsake me. Can you say the same thing? He will never leave you. Nor forsake you. He's there. He's closer than your own heartbeat. And I know that about my Lord. When I'm by myself, I'm never by myself. I'm always with him. No matter whether it's at home or whether it's in here with a group of people, whether it's driving in a car, I'm never alone. Jesus says, I will come and I'll be with you and I will never leave you. I will always be with you. And to me, I have to tell you, that knowledge that there is one who never leaves you nor forsakes you has changed my life. He said in verse 24, he who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is, is not mine but the Father's who sent me. My words are originating from my Father, and they're heavenly in their origin. 
But those who do not love me will not experience my presence with them. So that speaks of the world of non-believers who have no desire for him or his teachings, his word. And, and even if they try to do things that kind of like are good, like, oh, I'm going to try and live by the Sermon on the Mount or whatever, there's no love for Christ that spurs them on. And so he says, because they don't love my word, they're actually rejecting my father who sent me. And in rejecting the son, there is no fellowship with the father. In 1 John 2, 23, whoever denies the son doesn't have the father either. He who acknowledges the son has the father also. So if somebody says, oh, I believe in God, I love God, I follow God, but they don't have the son, Jesus would say, no, you don't. You don't have a relationship with the Father because you've rejected his son. You know, I, I see that in a very spiritual way, quite obviously. You have Jesus, you have the Father. But there's also a practical application as a father and a grandfather. I think I understand an aspect of that in a different way, and that is this. If you love my son or my daughter, I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you. You love my baby. And if you love my baby, I will love you. When I love God's baby, when I love Jesus, there's a relationship with his father. He loves me. I love his son. And the ones who don't love the son don't have a relationship with the father. So somebody can say, oh, I'm a God-fearer or I'm a believer but not in Jesus. And the Lord would say, then you and I don't have any relationship. Now, that's not me saying that. That's what we just read. If you don't have a relationship with the Son, you don't have the Father either. Because the only way to have a relationship with the Father is to have a relationship with the Son. And so that's why when you get saved, you have a relationship with God. Because you received His Son. And the Father loves you. And He manifests Himself to you. And that's because you've obeyed him. And you've obeyed him because he said, believe in my son. And when you believe in the son, you have relationship with the father, and you now start doing the things his word says because his words have become more dear to you and more precious to you than even your daily bread. Because you know man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And because you have that hunger, your life transforms. God manifests himself to you. You grow in your deepness of understanding, and your religion is no longer theoretical. It's practical and experiential. Because I know that I know that I know that Jesus Christ is alive. Because he lives, I live also.